Hi, hello everyone. Hello, Professor Tom and Professor Willie. And I'm Ting Chen. I'm from Taiwan. It's my great honor to introduce Professor Zhao to everyone. Willie Zhao is an assistant professor in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, China, with interdisciplinary training in critical discourse studies and curriculum studies. Sorry about that. She has been doing research on China's education and curriculum reforms at the nexus of tradition and modernity east and west. Her dissertation turned book, China's Education, Curriculum Knowledge, and Cultural Inscriptions Dancing with the Wing was out in June 2018 with Rowledge, and she was the recipient of 2019 era Early Curriculum Outstanding Research Award, SIG 171, Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, and Education. She has published articles in Discourse, Journal of Curriculum Studies, Curriculum Inquiry, Educational Philosophy and Theory, and Studies in Philosophy and Education. Um, now let's welcome Professor Zhao to share her studies with us. Okay, so I'm going to share uh, Willie's slide. Hey, Willie. Okay, hey, thank you. So can you hear me? Switch the slide, let me know, okay? Okay. Uh, Screen. Uh oh, let's see. Give me a second. Can can anyone see it? Everyone see it? Okay. Good. Uh, no. Okay. Thanks, G. Okay, so I, I just uh, changed the, the title a little bit. I put it as a language or discourse as a both colonial and decolonial gesture in transnational cultural knowledge reproduction. And I use China's Suyang curriculum reform as an example, okay? Um, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, thank you. So mm, I would basically I would uh, share with you the trajectory of how I have come up doing what I'm doing now, and how um, I have uh, what I have learned in medicine, and how those um, learning and sharing in medicine has prepared me, I could say, right, for my postdoctor studies after the UW medicine, right, um, Professor. Okay. Uh, Tom has always told us that uh, research starts after we finish our doctor's studies right? in terms of postdoctoral research for a whole lifetime, right? <laughs> okay. So I, I, first of all, I would share with you very briefly my intellectual background and then my research questions. And then I explain a little bit why I chose discourse the language as my lens or perspectives to cut into the present curriculum reforms in China uh, on a global platform, okay? And then I use this example, okay? I will use two examples actually. I will briefly uh, introduce my doctoral research project and I, I will not go deep into the specifics of this China's Su Young curriculum reform as I, I think it's pretty hard to explain and as well as understand those kinds of language specific, culture specific details, okay? So just let me know if you have any questions about one particular slide and I could stop and explain, okay? Uh, next, please. So before I uh, came to Madison, I had a social linguistics background particularly critical discourse analysis um, in the UK, I could say uh, intellectual um, and um, tradition, right? And then critical discourse analysis uh, in social linguistics would mainly ask the question or explore the question of who said what, in which way, and then for what, for achieving what kind of particular purposes. So it's a pretty detailed textual 
or contextual linguistic analysis, okay? And then some people, especially my former uh, colleagues, advisors, and then they um, paraphrase critical discourse analysis as also cultural discourse analysis. So their argument is these internationalizing and globalizing discourses uh, actually kind of westernization of China and also kind of colonization of this Chinese discourses and languages in modern China, uh, particu particularly starting the beginning of the 20th century and then lots of Western terms and language terms are uh, introduced into China as kind of new concepts, uh, just like uh, um, democracy and, and, you know, for example, also education, even though the two words of education, like a jiao yu in Chinese, right? We uh, traditionally had these two words, but they, they didn't mean the same thing. They didn't mean as a modern concept of education in the modern way, okay? So those colleagues claim those or critique the westernization of Chinese language as a form of Western colonialism, if I could put that way, okay? So I had that background and then had that kind of earlier understanding. And then when I came to Madison, um, we majored in this curriculum studies. So moved to Foucault's study, you know, and Foucault is also kind of um, discourse, right? And, uh, but discourse studies in a different way in association with power, subjectivity, etc. So to me, that was a very nice transition. And then finding um, Tom Pop Quiz was a totally a coincidence, right? And a lucky one, but I don't want to go deeper into that. It's really uh, a lucky coincidence, okay? Uh, and then after graduation, I worked at CUHK and I pushed further those philosophical, cultural, historical foundations of China curriculum on a global platform. So basically I go back into the past to better cut into the present and also cross-culturally try to dialogue those Chinese sensitivities or sensibilities with uh, the latest uh, turns in the Western scholarship, like the post-structural, post-foundational, effective, okay, things like that, new materialists, okay. And next one, please. And then my research questions. I think these questions are still guiding my research. So basically I was inspired by Chakrabarty's claim saying that Western categories and frameworks are indispensable yet insufficient in mapping out non-Western historical cultural sensibilities, right? But my question would be, then how could we do that, right? How is it possible, first of all, to discern those kinds of cultural sensibilities and then put them in to English? as it is, right? And beyond the Western frameworks and categories, okay? So two things, why would I say that we need to discern that first? Because it's a globalized world and then it's, and then, and then in modern China, a, a modern Chinese people are also subjected to this modern way of thinking, you know? So I put it as a kind of modernity and coloniality. So it's hard for us. I mean, modern people are so used to our way of thinking in China. And then it's, it's really hard to notice what kind of way of thinking or epistemes are culturally uh, Pacific or specific or unique, okay? And then I uh, situate uh, my research in this context of a transnational curriculum studies, okay? And then, um, 
in this past few years, basically after I graduated, I came across uh, the scholarship of epistemicide. Epistemicide basically means one episteme, one way of reasoning, overriding or eclipsing another one. It both happens within nation states, right, and beyond. So epistemicide um, goes beyond the boundaries of nation states or East or West or modernity, tradition or present past. So it could happen within culture. It couldn't happen in between or beyond. Okay, Dis different disciplines. And then mainly um, that speaks to the Suppress work on curriculum epistemicide. So actually I borrowed this term from him, curriculum epistemicide. Okay. And then particularly I pick up a language as a lens to look into this issue. And then why language, right? Why discourse that relates back to my own intellectual background. And from Madison, you know, we learned how to use this history of the present, right? And then the historical mode of inquiry is indeed helpful and provocative. And then going back into the past helps to cut into the present. And going into the Western scholarship helps to cut into or better access my own cultural self and cultural identity and cultural sensibilities, okay? Yeah, so why language? And so next one, please. So in terms of language and the discourse, I mostly draw upon Michel Foucault and uh, uh, Martin Heidegger. So these few quotes are always helpful to me. So Foucault in the book of Order of Things, he critiques the modern uh, notion of representation and the modern grammar of language, right? So basically uh, he says modern language is an enclosed meaning making system upon a signifier, signified relay play of ideas within a trap of philolo philolo phil philology, right? So philology means we, basically assume the, the legitimacy of the current grammar and we mostly seek its semantic meaning of those statements. So for example, we would, uh, in terms of Suyang curriculum reform, Suyang means competency-based, right? Competency-based curriculum reform. So we, we usually would ask a question like, what is it? What does it mean, right? that semantical meaning. Language in this case is treated as kind of rhetor rhetorical tools, okay? We use language to express something else. Okay? And then of course as modern criticism uh, need to, does not proceed from the observation that there's language towards the discovery of what that language means. Instead, we need to, uh, examine the deployment of manifest discourse towards a revelation of language in its crude being, okay? So um, for example, in my case, uh, I would uh, uh, use in the same example like a suya, right? Cur Competency-based curriculum. Instead of asking what it means as a linguistic term, I would ask how and in which ways these few words, these few terms would be used, would be selected in you know, preference, right? Or as against others, okay? And then in doing so, of uh, course that we need to work our way back from opinions, philosophies, and perhaps even from sciences to the words that made them possible and beyond that to a thought whose essential life has not yet been caught in the network of grammar. So working back, I think this is crucial for me. We historicize basically, okay? This language notions, not in terms of its meaning, but how it is historically possible, okay? And then to disturb the words we speak, to denounce the grammatical habits of our thinking and dissipate the myth that animate our words, to render once more noisy and audible element of signs that all discourse carries with it as it is spoken, okay? 
So I, I will just use an example um, of my doctoral research. Basically, the uh, Chinese schooling uh, in present, they use these terms like uh, school wind, teaching wind, learning wind. So wind discourses a lot. And then, but uh, we didn't recognize this wind language because according to the modern logic and modern grammar, there's a school wind and basically refers to or means school atmosphere or school model. So in that case, the school and wind, there's a cultural association between these two notions get eclipsed, okay? So that's the example I would like to use to show how I pick up Foucault's way of uh, going back and cutting into those commonsensical daily life discourses to the original, originary cultural uh, themes or principles that make it possible, okay? And uh, I think, of course, this um, thinking about language uh, closely related to Heidegger's understanding, right? I, to Heidegger, language first gives to every purpose for deliberation, its ways and underways. Without language, there will be lacking to every doing, every dimension in which it could bestow itself and be effective. So for example, Heidegger has a paper article on the, the issues of technology or problems of technology, something like that. And he says, technology is nothing about technological or nothing techno related to technological, something like that. And basically he uh, passes this daily life word of technology going back to its original roots and map out those some epistemic traces, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. And next one, please. So I said very briefly about that, about my doctoral research, right? So I encountered some schooling wind discourses, like a school wind, a teaching wind, and learning wind, okay, in Chinese. But nobody put those terms into school wind, learning wind, teaching wind. Instead, people put uh, people read it as school models, teaching atmosphere, learning styles. Okay, that's a semantic equivalence. But one day when I saw that school wind, I just wondered why school wind, right? Why not like uh, school water, etc.? Why is the notion wind? here is drawn upon, right, to describe or portray Chinese education. And then I historicize this wind education discourses instead of asking what does it mean, right? How does intersection become historically possible? So I, I just read back, read those texts or modern discourses back to those classic texts and then encountered Confucius envisioning of teaching learning in his commentary on this uh, book of change, as a particularly one hexagram on observation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then I reconceptualize that as Confucius' own envisioning, and I argue that the language of wind could be treated as China's educational signature language. So basically, yeah. So I, I follow Heidegger and Foucault's thinking on ontological language. Uh, so Foucault uses discourses a lot and Heidegger uses language a lot. So to me, there is a turning back, returning from this discourse. Discourse usually means, especially in linguistics, means language in use, okay? And then moving this discourses back to language. A language not as a kind of rhetorical means, a language as an ontological being, okay, in this one. So I, I particularly like this histor historical mode of language, and I like this um, language or discourse lens. And then at that time, you know, I didn't realize uh, consciously that uh, I was using, I was picking up language as a decolonial gesture, but mostly I was um, critiquing this language as a colonial gesture, basically, right? How this Chinese modern language become westernized as concepts, 
and how modern way of thinking is subject to this uh, represent representational way of thinking, basically conceptual way of thinking along a signifier signifier uh, logic. Okay, so this is a, a very brief revisit. I give you a glimpse of okay, how I pick up language, how I use this historical mode. And then for this, um, a doctor, yeah, please, next one, please. So continuing this doctoral research or continuing my research questions, guiding research questions, right? And also the language uh, lenses. I further uh, my research on this Chinese Suyang curriculum reform. So Suyang curriculum, Suyang basically um, means competencies, literacy and skills to most scholars, right? So under, uh, against this background of core competency curriculum reform worldwide, right? For example, the OECD put forward to this core competencies def definitions in the 1990s and the USA followed by pr proposing those 21st century skills, right? And the China in 2016, they released a, a core competency framework, but they named that, they used this suya, a cultural term for that, right? And the official claim is that Chinese suya framework is more than Western core competencies and literacies and skills, both semantically and culturally, okay? So culturally, they said they built this framework also uh, drawing upon the Confucian educational tradition, okay? On one hand, they borrow the Western uh, uh, frameworks. On the other hand, they also draw insights from the Confucian tradition, okay? And that's why they chose the word suya to replace an earlier one, su, which means quality, right? Quality education since the 1990s, okay? So suya is more than quality, su, right? But what is more here? So semantically, suya refers to both the skills, the indispensable skills, knowledge that is needed in the 21st century, but it also embraces this uh, personality, personal traits and characters and uh, emotions, attitudes, et cetera, okay? So both semantically and culturally, they claim the Chinese Suyang framework is more than a replica of the Western competencies framework, right? But my argument is that most Chinese policymakers and scholars are still subjected to modernity as a coloniality, as a form of epistemicide. So in two ways, right? In two expressions. First, they treat suya as a concept, and then they e equalize suya uh, as uh, the competencies, and literacy, the skills, okay? So that means even though they promoted the suya as a cultural unique term, they define it through the Western terms of literacy uh, competencies, okay? And the second one, uh, they in that within that kind of modern representational framework, they treat these uh, attitudes, emotions, characters, et cetera, as a psychological terms, okay, in no way different from this uh, Western or a modern, I could say, just like a Tyler Rationale, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And then my venture would to break apart Suya as a commonsensical notion or concept and to, to rewrite it as Su plus Ya. So basically to break the kind of the, the grammar, uh, to suspend, the conceptual logic, the modern grammar, and then read back, read them back toward uh, the classical texts and then gesture toward a holistic Chinese body thinking epistem. Okay, that's basically my main argument. So look at this one. This is a, a typical of uh, the definition that Chinese scholars give to Suya. Uh, of course, I put that into English, right? But look at his definition. He said, Suya has competency or competency 
uh, as its English gloss with the Latin root of competitor. Etymologically, competence signifies a gathering of varied abilities or powers, enabling a person to cope with a situation. With competitor, come means together, the tear means to seek, drive forward, put together. Competitor means to strive together, to cope with situations. To sum up, Suya in the first place signifies the comprehensive competencies needed when coping with a situation appropriate. In essence, Suya is a state of being a competency of human being. Uh, what interests me is, you know, the scholar identifies, understands Suya through competency. And when he talks about etymologically, he's talking about competency, the English word, not talking about suya itself. So in this definition, basically suya, or what is saying within the term suya itself is eclipsed, right? Okay, so this is a kind of people try to equalize suya to this Western terms of competencies, literacies and skills. So that's why I say, even though people are talking about suya a lot, they are reinvigorating the cultural term of suya. But what they are talking about suya is the Western uh, discourses. So basically what is saying within the cultural term itself is not made uh, visible, okay? So suya is still treated as a modern concept, an empty signifier that could refer to different signifies, okay? So this reminds me of Foucault's critique within a trap of philology. We assume the legitimate existence of grammar and ask its semantic meaning and meaning only, right? So we assume that suya is a concept and then we ask, what does it mean? And we explain it through other terms, okay? So this is one example. Okay, one argument. And then along that, I argue that Chinese intellectuals and institutions have scribed to the murder of their own cognitive matrix. The, the sentence is from a Prasiva's book, right? But that still applies to this current case. And this is uh, put as modernity as coloniality. So even though the colonialism, right, colonization ended a long time ago, but the way people think is still uh, remin reminiscent, right, is still um, similar to this kind of modernity, Western modernity or modernity, this modern way of thinking, conceptual, right. And then for the second expression, circulization of those actions and emotions is another expression. So I in that 2021, this book chapter, right, I, I put to this table and then give you a, a further, some further um, understanding or expression how these kind of ethical, aesthetic ethical uh, terms are, are used or are conceptualized basically as concepts again. Okay, so it's the modern way of thinking, the conceptual the representation, you know, is everywhere. It's a dominant logic. And interestingly, look at this, the last one here, the love and protect the nature. Originally in the, in the original, in the, uh, in the first version, earlier version, the draft version of this uh, uh, curriculum guide, right? Um, originally it says uh, harmonization between the human beings and kind of nature. So it's, but uh, in the final version, it becomes love and protect nature. So basically it's a human uh, versus uh, nature as an object, a subject versus of anthropocentrism, something like that. So if you analyze this kind of modern uh, text, and it's very easy to see the different expressions of this modernity, right? Anthrop uh, anthropocentric, and a human versus uh, a subject versus object disorderly, and then the then conceptual way of thinking, et cetera, et cetera, and psychologization of these attitudes and emotions. Okay? And this one, the psychologization of attitudes and emotions, basically 
you know, was critiqued by Dwayne Huberner back in the 1960s when he critiqued this Tyler rationale as an instrumental logic in designing this curriculum, et cetera, right? Usually psychological language in terms of concepts, skills, attitudes, and other behavioral terms, okay? Yeah, next one, please. Uh, then, then my question would be how to re-unpack, how to read Suya as a cultural term, and then beyond this trope or trap of conceptual competencies, right? So I follow in this uh, ontological language perspective again and break it into a form of Su plus Yang. And then I read back this each individual character or word to its etymological roots, the traces, and then I, I just uh, uh, gesture toward this holistic uh, Chinese body thinking. So Wu Guangming, a scholar born in Taiwan, but uh, later on working in the US, right? So he has been uh, writing about this body thinking a lot. And then he, this, uh, yeah. So I think this scholar is quite um, thought provocative to me. Okay. And he, he did uh, three degrees, I think, within five years. Uh, and then has a rich background, both religion and philosophy, comparative philosophy, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And then he said, uh, and not only proposing this body thinking, um, in contrast with this Western mind thinking, here body is a holistic, Chinese body is a holistic notion. It's basically a mind, body, heart together, okay? And in my doctoral research, I also came to realize the Chinese term for body, basically or literally says body experiences, right? So my doctoral research uh, looks at uh, three issues basically. One is language, second is body, and third is difference. Okay. And then, in this, after graduation, I'm trying to push further this body dimension okay, and the body thinking epistem. Okay, so I, as I said earlier, I'm not going deep into this cultural uh, specifics. I just uh, share with you um, my way of thinking and on my method of doing the research. Okay, yeah, next one, please. So here, and then I realized that the language could be used as both a colonial and decolonial gesture. So basically we could unpack language as a site of epistemicide, basically. Okay, so Su Yang is an example, wind, teaching wind, learning wind is another example. And then I realized there's a discourse there's a discourse, uh, this uh, language this episteme or discourse episteme rupture. So people usually take language or discourse as tools, as linguistic, semantic tools, right? But not from an ontological way. But I take, so I read the discourse back to language and language as a kind of epistemic traces, as a kind of ontological being itself, uh, basically drawing upon Foucault and Heidegger's work. Okay, next one, please. So I think that's basically what I would like to share with you all. And then here, uh, Jing sent me some questions and I posed the questions here. But before we go to the questions and open up to Q&A, I would like to ask you any questions or comments on what I just shared.